Mr. Speaker, I appreciate uh, that uh, everyone's gone back to their offices, but you and uh, but you and me, and I appreciate you sticking around to uh, to get this uh, to get this hour uh, in. Uh, it's not going to be an exciting hour. Ordinarily, I bring down uh, charts and graphs and try to uh, uh, try to share something in a visual way that folks might not have seen before. Uh, today, it's just words uh, because words matter, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've just finished in this uh, chamber this fantastic. Uh, I, you've heard me say it. It's, it was a festival of democracy. Uh, we, we had every member who had an amendment. They brought them to the Rules Committee. We made over 100 of them in order. It's been three days, Mr. Speaker, and we, we passed in a very bipartisan way federal transportation policy for the first time in more than a decade. Democrats had failed to get it done. Republicans had failed to get it done. We, as 435 individual members, representing diverse constituencies across the nation. We came together today and we got it done. They said it couldn't be done. Chairman Bill Schuster of Pennsylvania said it could be done. Ranking member Pete DeFazio out of Oregon said it could be done and we did it. Something has happened, Mr. Speaker, in this town that has people identifying as Democrats or Republicans first and as members of this body, of the Article I legislature, second. And it's bad. It's bad for the country. It's bad for the, uh, for the, uh, for the people we represent. It's bad process. And, Mr. Speaker, that's what I want to talk about today. You can't see the, uh, the chart uh, that I have here. But it's a quote from President Obama. Uh, you will remember it. Uh, back in August of, of 2013, you will remember we've, we've worked together with the President nine different times. We've repealed portions of the, of the President's health care bill. We've, we've repealed them. They were unworkable. He knew it. We knew it. We came together nine times. He signed legislation to law that, that repealed parts of the President's health care bill. But it was, the, it was the summer there of 2013, and, and we were talking about how to come together on some of the bigger problems in the President's health care bill. You remember the, the mandates were getting ready to go into effect, the business mandates, the individual mandates, and the country wasn't ready. The country was not ready. We all knew it. Every member from left to right, Mr. Speaker, knew it. The President held a press conference, and he said this. In a normal political environment, it would have been easier for me to simply call up the speaker and say, you know what, this is a tweak that doesn't go to the essence of the law. It has to do with, for example, are we able to simplify the attestation of employers to whether they're already providing health insurance or not? It looks like there may be some better ways to do this. This is the Pre President Obama speaking. Better ways to do this. Let's make a technical change to the law. The President goes on to say, Mr. Speaker, that would have been the normal thing that I would prefer to do, but we're not in a normal atmosphere around here when it comes to Obamacare, the President says. We did have the executive authority to do so, and we did so. Mr. Speaker, this was from that very contentious time trying to solve problems for the American people. Again, problems the White House knew existed, problems the Congress knew existed. And the President says, you know what, if it was ordinary times, like any time in the past 225 years, I would have called the United States Congress and I'd have said, listen, the Constitution gives you Article I powers to legislate, and I need a legislative change made because the law's not working. But he didn't. And he said he didn't. And he said he wasn't going to. He said he was going to go it alone. And the disappointment in that decision, in this body, was very partisan, Mr. Speaker. It was very partisan. I don't know how we get past the allegiance to the president because he is from our party. Republicans did this when George Bush was in office. Democrats are doing this when, when President Obama is in office. It's not about who the president is. It's about what the president does. What the president does is implement the laws that we pass. He doesn't change the laws. And every time we fail on behalf of our constituents to stand together as 435 representatives of the people and instead become representatives of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, we fail America. Mr. Speaker, what I have here is a chart uh, of the Supreme Court decision in the NLRB v. Noel Canning case. 
You may remember that one. I just got in the Congress, Mr. Speaker. I just got in the Congress. The, the, the President was talking about making appointments. And as you know, the, the advise and consent clause of the Constitution says the President can make appointments, but he needs to, to get the consent of the Senate to do so. Well, the Senate wouldn't give him consent. And so while the Senate was away for a day, the President went in to the recess appointments clause of the Constitution. In fact, he got a big letter from the, from the, legis the, from the uh, legal department there at the, at the White House that said he had the powers to pretend that the Senate had adjourned uh, for the session and to go ahead and make appointments anyway. The protest, Mr. Speaker, of the President usurping congressional authority was partisan. Republicans said no, Democrats said ah. He probably has the right to do it anyway. We didn't stand up for the people we represent. We didn't stand up for the Constitution we swore to uphold, Mr. Speaker. We divided ourselves by party instead of uniting ourselves on principle. We had to go to the Supreme Court, Mr. Speaker. Supreme Court can't decide on anything unanimously, Mr. Speaker. If the question is what time are we going to meet today to talk about cases, it's a 5-4 decision. You know this to be true. But the Supreme Court came together, Noel Canning, and said, that's crazy. That's crazy. The President of the United States can't just pretend he's king. He's not the king. Pre the, the, to quote, and I'm paraphrasing when I, when I, when I say that, uh, Mr. Speaker, but to quote the Supreme Court decision, they said this. Regardless, the Recess Appointments Clause is not designed to overcome serious institutional friction. It provides a subsidiary method for appointing officials when the Senate is away during a recess. Here, as in other contexts, friction between the branches is an inevitable consequence of our constitutional structure. Friction between the branches, Mr. Speaker, is an inevitable consequence of our constitutional structure. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel good because, Mr. Speaker, I go back home all the time and constituents say, Rob, why can't you get more done? Why can't you get more done? Well, it turns out it's because of this. It's because of this Constitution that said, listen, if Congress is at work, your liberties and your freedoms may be under attack. Right? What we do here isn't generally to give freedoms back to people. Generally what we do is to restrict freedoms a little bit here. We want it to be slow. Here in the House, we're a little faster. There in the Senate, they're supposed to be a little slower, Mr. Speaker, but it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be the inevitable consequence of our constitutional structure. But, Mr. Speaker, this body... Not Republicans in this body, not Democrats in this body, but this body collectively was silent as power flowed down Pennsylvania Avenue away from the Article I legislature down to the Article II executive. It took the Article III courts, Mr. Speaker, to write our constitutional framework. Shame on us. Shame on us collectively for not standing up, Mr. Speaker. My constituents are frustrated by the pace of progress in this town. They are frustrated by what looks like the politi politi by the politics that are being played here, Mr. Speaker, uh, when policy should be our focus. I think it's up to us to educate uh, folks to, to, to proudly say it is the inevitable consequence of our constitutional structure. But when we stand together, as we have this week on this transportation bill, there is still more that unites us as a country than that divides us. Environmental leadership, Mr. Speaker, it's one of those areas of overreach that this particular White House is aggressively engaged in. Again, the pushback has been partisan pushback. It has not been Article I legislative pushback as it should. I want to go back to some prior presidents, Mr. Speaker, and I'll, I'll, I'll look at Republican presidents. I'm a Republican. I'll, I'll, I'll look at what it looked like when, when Republicans were running the show in the, in the White House. You know, the EPA was signed into law by Richard Nixon, Mr. Speaker. 
on the creation of the EPA, President Nixon said this. He said, the reorganizations which I am here proposing afford both the Congress and the executive branch an opportunity to reevaluate the adequacy of the existing program authorities involved in these consolidations. I look forward to working with the Congress in this task. The Congress, the administration, and the public all share a profound commitment to, to the rescue of our natural environment. Richard Nixon had a, had a calling when it comes to the environment, Mr. Speaker. He had a calling. He didn't say, I'm the President of the United States, I'm just going to rewrite the entire environmental code and dictate that it's the law of the land. He came to Congress and said, protecting our natural resources is a shared American value. It's a shared American value. I'm going to go to Congress, I'm going to win the votes, we're going to change the law, and we're going to make it so. The Clean Air Act, Mr. Speaker signed into law in 1990 by President George H.W. Bush. He said this. He said, today I'm signing S-1630, a bill to amend the Clean Air Act. I take great pleasure in signing it as a demonstration to the American people of my determination that each and every American shall breathe clean air. Passage of this bill is an indication that the Congress shares my commitment to a strong Clean Air Act. How do you know, Mr. Speaker, if Congress shares your commitment if you don't bring the language to Congress to have Congress ratify it? The President can propose all the legislation he wants to. We still have to pass it. If our frustration about results allows us to let folks shortcut the constitutional process, we will all, 330 million of us, suffer. I remember when President Reagan was trying to raise the gas tax, Mr. Speaker. I talk about that because we were talking about transportation bill this week and transportation funding this week. He stood on the, uh, on the lawn, Mr. Speaker, there beside the, the Rose Garden, and he says, we deserve a world-class infrastructure in America. And I propose that we double the gas tax. Yes, this is conservative Ronald Reagan talking about doubling taxes in order to build America. America didn't agree with him, yet he went out there and sold it. How do we get fundamental tax reform in this country, Mr. Speaker? 1986. The country wasn't ready for fundamental tax reform. The Congress couldn't agree on fundamental tax reform. Ronald Reagan took it and sold it every single day until he got it done. That's what's supposed to happen. We work together to accomplish these priorities. Past presidents have done exactly that. Mr. Speaker, it hadn't been two weeks ago we were in here talking about the president's overreach on the Department of Labor fidu fid fiduciary rule. You remember that uh, bill? We had it here on the floor of the House, Mr. Speaker, where the president just decided through the Department of Labor that long-standing investment law, as determined by the SEC, was no longer going to be the law of the land, that the Department of Labor was going to take on some new rulemaking authorities in this area. The President wanted to make some changes. Congress didn't want to make changes. The President said this. He said, what I won't accept is the notion that there's nothing we can do. So we're going to keep pushing for this rule. Keep pushing, Mr. Speaker, didn't mean come to Congress to sell you and to sell me. Pushing didn't mean go to the United States Senate to build a coalition. Pushing meant ignoring the Congress and going straight away. Now, I point this out as a success, Mr. Speaker. I point this out as a success because our opposition to this wasn't partisan. Our opposition to this, Mr. Speaker, was bipartisan. I have here a letter from September, Mr. Speaker, signed by 90 Democrats that said, Mr. President, don't do this. Don't do this. This is not the proper path forward. The plurality of the Democratic caucus here said, Mr. President, don't go forward. The President drove forward anyway. Mr. Speaker, the, the times that I've seen the President change his mind in my four and a half years in Congress have not been because of my persuasive oratory or even by the strength of this institution. It's been because the American people have spoken. When the American people speak, the President is a good listener. 
And what the president is hearing today is the ends justify the means. I need results, and so however you get those results, Mr. President, I'll be behind you. We're starting to turn that corner, Mr. Speaker, because I promise you, whatever, whatever is good for Democrats today is going to be bad for Democrats tomorrow. Whatever is bad for Republicans today is going to be good for Republicans tomorrow. The, the parties will change. The political environment will change. But when you short-circuit the process, the short-circuiting lasts forever. We change expectations of the American people. We change expectations of what the Constitution means, Mr. Speaker. I applaud 90 of my Democratic colleagues standing with this Congress saying, Mr. President, don't go it alone. Mr. Speaker, this isn't something that I'm just coming up with out of, out of thin air. When the President wasn't President Obama, when he was Senator Obama, he had these same concerns. He spoke out time and time again about overreaches of President George Bush. Oftentimes he spoke out alone. Republicans weren't standing with him to speak out because it was a Republican president. Republicans said, you know what? I want to support my president, so even if he is coloring outside the lines a little bit, it's probably important to the country that he do so. That's a failure. That's a failure because our primary job here is not to be Republicans, Democrats. Our primary job here is to be Article I representatives of the American people. The president said this on immigration. He's talking at a, at a Univision town hall meeting in, in 2011, Mr. Speaker. He said, this does not mean, though, we can't make decisions, for example, to emphasize enforcement on those who've engaged in criminal activity. This was the, the beginning of his program. But he goes on to say, it also doesn't mean that we can't strongly advocate and propose legislation that would change the law. Time and time again, Folks would ask him to, to do what he could as the executive to change immigration law, and he would say, listen, I'm not the king, I'm the president. The Congress has to change the laws. I can only enforce the laws. He was right. He was right each and every time that he said that. The administration can propose, but we have to implement. Though fast forward... Uh, to about this time last year, Mr. Speaker, and the President says this. He says, and to those members of Congress who question my authority to make our immigration system work better or question the wisdom of my acting where Congress has failed, I have but one answer. Pass a bill. Pass a bill, he says. In the meantime, I'm just going to do things the way I, I, I want to do things. That, that, that's, the, that's the opposite of the I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill song that we all learned as, as children, Mr. Speaker. The bill comes first. The law change comes last. After the president signs the law, it becomes, that signs the bill, it becomes the law. We have to propose it first. How many meetings have you had with the president, Mr. Speaker, where he's pushing his immigration agenda, trying to get you to buy in to his bill? The answer is zero, because he doesn't have a bill, and he hasn't been knocking on any of our doors, and my Democratic friends would say the same. How many meetings with the president have you had, Mr. Speaker? where the president's trying to persuade you about his fiduciary rule and why that change is important for America and why we should move that bill forward. The answer is zero, because he's never come to Capitol Hill to make that pitch. He's not making it to Democrats, and he's not making it to Republicans. He's going it alone. How many times has the president come and knocked on your door, Mr. Speaker, to try to sell you on his ozone regulations or his clean energy plan? and on and on and on. And the answer is he hasn't, and we have been complicit in allowing that unilateral action. It is bad for America. It is not the process that our framers envisioned. This is what the president said on immigration. This is a, 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 that same Univision town hall meeting. The question was, Mr. President, my question will be as follows, with an executive order could you be able to stop deportations of students? Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm not down here talking about immigration policy today. I'm not. Our immigration system is broken. I represent constituents, Mr. Speaker, who have had family members on the list not for five years, not for 10 years, not for 15 years, but for 20 years and more standing in line waiting for their chance to come to America. 
Our system is broken. I have employers who want to build in our district. They can't get the people they need from their home countries to come and manage those operations. Our system is broken. We all know it. We have a chance to fix it. But when the president goes around the Congress, he doesn't fix it. He breaks it further. He says this. With respect to the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, that's just not the case because there are laws on the books that Congress has passed. And I know that everybody here at Bell is studying hard so you know that we've got three branches of government. Congress passes the law, the executive branch's job is to enforce and implement those laws, and then the judiciary has to interpret the laws. There are enough laws on the books by Congress, the president says, that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce our immigration system. That for me to simply, through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates would not conform with my appropriate role as president. Mr. Speaker, the words of President Obama. There are enough laws on the books by Congress that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce our immigration system that for me to simply through executive order ignore those constitutional mandates would not conform with my appropriate role as president. March 2011. You wouldn't know that's what he believed in November of 2015. Mr. Speaker, what happened? in those four years. What happened in those four years, and I will tell you what has happened, is we have been silent as a body. We have been vocal as Republicans. We have been vocal as Democrats. We have been silent as a body. As a body. As a representative body. Article one of the Constitution, it is our job to legislate, and it is our job to rein in those presidents who would legislate on our behalf. What our framers feared, Mr. Speaker, was an all-powerful executive. That's what they'd come from. That is what we should fear today. Not a Republican president, not a Democratic president, but an all-powerful president. Congress passes the law. The president enforces it. Mr. Speaker, if you want to know the outcome of that overreach, if you want to know where Congress is, again, the president's not on Capitol Hill selling those priorities. He's simply down in the executive branch with a, with a phone and a pen implementing those priorities. But if you want to know what the other two branches of government think, the judiciary said no. The Congress said no. It, it's not a confusion about where the different article, where the different branches of government are. We have one branch that's saying, yes, that's the executive who has no lawmaking authority whatsoever. We have two branches saying, no, the branch that makes the law, the legislative branch, and the branch that interprets the law, the judiciary branch. We are united in the no's. What we are not united on is the yes. We talk about bipartisanship in this chamber, Mr. Speaker. It always is striking to me. What's bipartisan is the opposition to the presidential overreach. That's what's bipartisan. The, the, the support for it is partisan sometimes. A minority of, of folks are supporting the president on that. It's bipartisan in its disdain is too strong of a word, Mr. Speaker, but in some ways it's not, uh, it's not strong enough. It's, it's that we owe our constituents better. It's that we owe them better. My voting card has my name on it, Mr. Speaker, but it's not mine. It's borrowed from the 7th District of Georgia. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to 700,000 folks back home who didn't send me here to satisfy my priorities. They sent me here to satisfy their priorities. And I don't believe that as a nation, Mr. Speaker, we believe the ends justify the means. I hope that we don't. I hope that we have not fallen so far, Mr. Speaker, that we now believe the Constitution as the rule book for America is less important than what the results are. Anybody involved in manufacturing, Mr. Speaker, knows if you have a flawed process, you're going to produce a flawed product. Only with a good process can you produce a good product. The Constitution gives us a good process. 
When we ignore it, we have a flawed process and a flawed product. I'll go to the President's environmental policies, Mr. Speaker, and I, I want to make it clear. I represent a district that plays outside, I would argue, more than any other district in the country. You want folks who love clean air and clean water? Come down to my part of the world. You want folks who are stewards of Mother Earth? Come down to my part of the world. You want folks who love green space, who love parks, who love national trailways and bikeways? Come down to my part of the world. We love being outside. We'll ride a bike. We'll push a stroller. We don't care. We just want to be outside in it. And so if the president came to me and said, Rob, Mother Earth is in peril. I would need you to work with me to solve that problem. I would be the best listener you could imagine. But that's not the way the process is working in the four and a half years I've been in Congress. Mr. Speaker, the president's clean power plan. This is shutting down power plants in the great state of Georgia, Mr. Speaker. This, this is, this is the, the, the position of the administration to protect Mother Earth. We're going to close down the power plants that we've just spent billions of dollars improving to meet the last round of environmental regulation. And then with those, with those power plants closed down, we're now going to spend billions more to build brand new facilities to generate electricity. I promise you that is not going to result in fewer emissions uh, to, in, in the atmosphere than if we let these plants run out their useful life with all of the improvements that had gone upon them. But we didn't get to vote on that, Mr. Speaker. We didn't get to vote on that. That was an executive decree. Waters of the U.S., Mr. Speaker. Waters of the U.S., that's the bill. Well, when it was a bill, we rejected it. it was, it's the initiative from the White House that said the, the framework we've had in this country for uh, 100 years of the federal government controlling navigable waterways and local state governments controlling the other waterways, that framework's gone. If a drop of water falls, it's now the federal government's responsibility to regulate it. Why? Because apparently we can't be trusted back in Georgia to take good care of our natural resources. Nonsense. Nonsense. Mr. Speaker, my district sits on the Continental Divide. We have built a billion dollar water treatment plant where we're putting the water back into our local lake cleaner than we took it out. And while half the, the districts on the other side of the Continental Divide, we know that the Chattahoochee River Basin is in a water deficit. And so we spend bukus of money pumping the water back up from one side of the Continental Divide so that we can let it go in the basin that, uh, that needs the water so badly. We're stewards, Mr. Speaker, not stewards with your money. We're not spending somebody else's money on these projects. We're spending our money on these projects because we believe in taking care of America's natural resources. The President, not through selling it to Congress, not through selling it to the American people, but with the pen and the phone, federalized water across the, the board. Where was the bipartisan outcry? It was lacking. And finally, the revised ozone air quality standards, Mr. Speaker. If you're confused, it's that we never got the last round of ozone standards implemented. Those, those still haven't gone into effect yet. The President's dropped a new round of ozone uh, standards on America. Not because Congress worked on it, we didn't. Not because Congress passed something, we didn't. But because the President thought it was important and he wrote the law for himself. How does Congress feel about this? Well, turns out members of this body said, you know what, if this is the direction the president wants to go, let me make this pitch. Let me make this pitch to Congress, see if the Congress agrees uh, with the president. Carbon emissions, the cap and trade uh, program, the clean power plan, rejected. Waters of the U.S., rejected ozone standards rejected. It's not that Congress hasn't spoken on these issues. We have, Mr. Speaker. We have. It's not that the President doesn't know what the Article I Congress wants. He does. He just doesn't like what the Article I Congress decided. And so he's decided to do it himself. And we've been complicit in allowing that to happen. Not even we, 435 of us, Mr. Speaker. We, 320 million of us, and there's going to be a price to pay for that. Mr. Speaker, Congress is, is active on these issues, active on these issues. It's not as if folks in this body don't care. They care deeply. We passed the RAINS uh, Act, uh, Mr. Speaker, to say, listen, if the president is going to start doing some rules on his own, we need to come back and review those after the fact in Congress. 
passed 243 to 165. Regulatory Integrity uh, Protection Act, trying to, to, for those jurisdictions like mine, where the local governments are taking such good care of our natural resources, trying to protect their right to continue to protect our local natural resources, passed 261 to 155. The Rate Payer Protection Act that said, for Pete's sakes, it hasn't been five years since you told us to spend billions to make these power plants uh, workable for the next generation. Now you're telling us we have to close these power plants. That can't possibly be the right uh, way for, for America to get clean energy. Can't possibly be the right way to be, to be stewards of, of taxpayer dollars. Pass that bill 247 uh, to 180. The EPA Science Advisory Board Act that said, listen, We've got to get together on the science. We, if, we, if we can't figure out what the facts are, we're never going to agree on what the solution uh, is. And so let's have a, let's have a, 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 a standard uh, for what good science looks like that we can all rally together around past here in the House. Mr. Speaker, folks aren't confused about where the Congress is on this issue. The president is not confused about where the Congress is on this issue. The president believes the ends justify the means. Article I Congress passes the law. Article II White House enforces the law. Article III Judiciary interprets the law. Well, the judiciary had a chance to do a little interpreting, had a chance to look at the, uh, at the uh, uh, waters of the U.S. and, and, and the clean water uh, issue, and the court said this. This is the Sixth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. What is of greater concern to us in balancing the harms is the burden potentially visited nationwide on governmental bodies, state and federal, as well as on private parties, and the impact on the public in general, implicated by the rules redrawing of jurisdictional lines over certain of the nation's waters. The court says, hey, wait a minute, we're worried about the impact on America. I don't want the court to be worried about the impact on America. I want the court to be worried about what the law of the land is. I want the Congress to be worried about the impact of America. I want the president to be listening to Congress and enforcing the laws that Congress passed. It's taken the courts to say, Mr. President, you've gone a bit too far. The court goes on. It says the sheer breadth of the ripple effect caused by this rules, definitional changes, Council strongly in favor of maintaining the status quo for the time being. This is still being litigated. It's still being litigated. The court says the detrimental impact of this new rule that Congress has never seen, except in the form that we rejected it, the damage to America is so severe, we're going to issue an injunction to prevent the president from going forward, Mr. Speaker. It gives me no pride, no pride, to have nine justices in robes running the United States of America. Americans elected a president to implement the law, and they elected a Congress to write the law, and we should be doing that together. We found ourselves powerless in doing that, asking the courts to solve that issue instead. Courts go on. Neither is there any indication that the integrity of the nation's waters will suffer imminent injury if the new scheme is not immediately implemented. That's, that's why they allowed the injunction. They said, I don't know what it is the president's trying to solve here, but there's no harm coming. There's time to sort this out. Now, they mean time to sort it out in the courts. What about time to sort it out in the Congress, Mr. Speaker? Who is it who loves the waters of the U.S. bill? If they do, they should come and they should make their pitch. The president should come and he should make his pitch. When was the last time you saw him on TV selling the waters of the U.S. bill, Mr. Speaker? When was it? The answer is you haven't seen him on TV selling it. He's not selling it. He's just doing it. When have you seen him selling the ozone standards? The answer is he's not selling it. He's just doing it. And the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. We have to ask him to get out there and sell it. Your job as president isn't just to do it. Your job as president is to get the Congress to allow you to do it, to sell the American people who will sell the Congress, who will change the law of the land. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you know Lawrence Tribe. He's a Harvard uh, law professor. Uh, he, in fact, he was President Obama's uh, constitutional law uh, professor. I would not call him a conservative by any uh, stretch of the, of the word, at least not in political terms, perhaps constitutionally. Lawrence Tribe says this about the president's 
clean air, clean, clean power plan. He says to justify the clean power plan, the EPA has brazenly rewritten the history of an obscure section of the 1970 Clean Air Act. Frustration with congressional inaction cannot justify throwing the Constitution overboard to rescue this lawless EPA proposal. Mr. Speaker, I want you to, want you to, follow, want you to follow that rationale. This isn't something that has snuck up on us here in the past few weeks, here in the past few months, here in the past few years. The President dug deep into a 45-year-old law and said, it appears to me we've misunderstood this law for the past 45 years. We've misunderstood it. And apparently, 45 years ago, we absolutely made an effort through Congress and the White House to give the President the authority, in fact, the obligation to rewrite America's energy laws in this fashion. Nonsense. Nonsense. President's constitutional law professor. Frustration with congressional inaction cannot justify throwing the Constitution overboard to rescue this lawless EPA proposal. I get the frustration with congressional inaction. Mr. Speaker, I get it. If we had frustration meters around here, mine would be ticking up near the top. But my experience is the way to address that frustration isn't to take my toys and go home. The way to address that frustration is to find somebody on the other side of the aisle who I think I can trust, who I think I can talk to, who I think I can listen to, and to work together to find an answer, to work together to find a solution. What is absent in all of these proposals that I have listed, Mr. Speaker, is anyone working together to make this proposal the law of the land. The only working together that's happening, Mr. Speaker, are folks working together to prevent these proposals from being the law of the land. Process matters. Process matters. Mr. Speaker, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish close to where I began. I was a new congressman. Just been elected, 700,000 people in the great state of Georgia counting on me to be their voice, counting on me to succeed on their priorities. Right out of the gate, the president says, you know what? I've been trying to get the people I want appointed to a board, and the Senate won't do what I want them to do. And because the Senate won't do what I want them to do, I'm going to do it by myself. When did that become okay, Mr. Speaker? We suffer from a little of that here. House won't do what I want it to do, so I'm going to take my toys and go home. House won't do what I want it to do, so I'm going to gum up the works and shut down the process. House won't do what I want it to do. Well, guess what? In a representative democracy, the, nobody does what you want them to do, Mr. Speaker. You got to go out and find 51% of America to agree with you, and that's when you get things done. I do not fault the president for his policies, though I disagree with him on them. I fault him for implementing those policies unilaterally, unconstitutionally, instead of going out and selling America on them. That's what's so great about this institution, Mr. Speaker. If you have the votes, you don't have to fuss about it. Folks come down to the House floor, gnashing of teeth, tearing of clothes, self-flagellation going on here on the floor on a regular basis. If you have the votes, you don't have to make a scene. You just got to go out and win the votes. You just have to go out and win the argument. If you win the argument, the law will change, Mr. Speaker. America works. America works. The Constitution works. You just have to follow it. You just have to believe in it. You have to believe in the Constitution. You have to believe in the American people that it governs. Nine to zero, the Supreme Court told the White House and its entire legal team that crafted a too cute by half explanation of why this was all going to be okay and roses and sunshine, hunky dory. Nine to zero, the court said, no, no. 
That's not what the president does. That's not what the White House does. That's not what you're allowed to do in America. Regardless, the Supreme Court says, the Recess Appointments Clause is not designed to overcome serious institutional friction. Mr. Speaker, we have serious institutional friction. I don't bemoan it. I celebrate it. I think friction was, was, was part, of the, part of the process. Turns out the court agrees with me. They go on to say it simply provides a subsidiary method for appointing officials when the Senate is away during a recess. Hence the word recess appointments clause. Here, as in other contexts, in other contexts, Mr. Speaker, all of these other issues the court now has on their plate from executive overreach. Here is another context. Friction between the branches is an inevitable consequence of our constitutional structure. Mr. Speaker, I'm just one vote in a 435-member institution. But my constituents would place that one vote on the side of being the Article I legislature rather than on the side of being the best Republican America has ever seen. My constituents would ask me to place that vote on the side of being the legislative branch, that, that institution from which the ideas percolate, that, that, that part of the U.S. House that's closest to the American people. They would ask me to pledge to be a part of this institution, not the Republican National Committee, not the National Republican Congressional Committee, not the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, not the Democratic National Committee. Mr. Speaker, we have an amazing opportunity and a solemn obligation in this institution. My commitment is to be a good listener to all the policy concerns my colleagues have on the other side of the aisle. Mr. Speaker, I'll be a good listener. may not agree with you, but I'll give you a chance to settle me. But we have to be united on behalf of all of our constituents back home in saying that the Constitution gives only one branch the ability to write the law, and that's the Article I legislature. When we ignore the President, Mr. Speaker, we do so at our own peril, at our institutional peril. When the President ignores the Congress, he does so at his own peril, at executive branch institutional peril. I was on the elevator with uh, one of the great uh, uh, leaders of this institution, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. John Dingle out of Michigan. And uh, he was on the elevator. A young Democrat climbed on the elevator uh, uh, with him. And the young Democrat was, was complaining that he didn't have a personal relationship with the president. He said, I don't get to see enough of the, the president. The president's not on Capitol Hill enough. The, uh, Mr. Dingle said, well, son, be careful what you wish for. Remember LBJ. We had LBJ over at the Library of Congress, a, 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 book, uh, a book study just, just this week. Different presidents handle their relationship with Congress in different ways. Some are involved too much, some are involved not enough, but everyone is involved. Mr. Speaker, this is supposed to be a battle of ideas, not a battle of ideologies. This is supposed to be a battle of policy, not a battle of partisans. This is supposed to be an opportunity to succeed on behalf of folks back home. And I will tell you it is an opportunity that we are losing when we unite ourselves based on red and blue as opposed to uniting ourselves based on Article I uh, and Article II. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. So